fate, kismet, destiny. Throughout human history, people of all cultures have used different words to describe the same idea. That some events, perhaps all events, are predetermined. The concept behind the idea is that the average person has no power to control certain events, even when the events themselves negatively impact on that person. This idea is expressed in common sayings that we hear every day. Things like, it was bound to happen, or everything happens for a reason, or it's God's will. There is a resignation involved in this idea. It's almost as if the belief in predestination absolves a person from the results of their action or inaction. If the concept of fate, kismet, or destiny is ultimately self-defeating, where did it come from? And why does it still have such a powerful hold on the human imagination? My name is Ronika Jacobs, and you have found my podcast, Strive for More, Your Best Life Now. While there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, you have taken the time out to listen to this one. And so for that, I would like to say thank you. Without any further delay, let's get to it. Let's strive for more. Episode 119, The Art of Self-Discipline. The idea of fate is an old one. When we look back through history, we can see that fate, in one form or another, was a central part of the belief systems of almost every major ancient civilization. The ancient Greeks had a strong belief in the power of fate. In their mythology, fate was represented by the Morai. The name Morai derives from the ancient Greek word mora, which meant to a lot or to a portion. Our word merit is a derivative of mora. There were three Morai women. Clotho, who was the spinner. She sat and spun the thread of life for each individual. Lachesis was the measurer. She measured out the amount of thread that each individual was allotted. And finally, there was Atropos, whose name means inevitable. It was she who cut the thread of life, ending every individual's existence at a moment and manner of her choosing. The idea of the three fates was a powerful one that was echoed by many other cultures. You probably remember the three fates if you've ever read Shakespeare's Macbeth or also heard about the three fates in Oedipus Rex. The Romans basically adopted the Greeks' concept of the fates, calling their version the Parthi. The Parthi, Nona, Decima, and Morta, spun, measured, and cut the thread of life, respectively. Now, in Yoruba, fate is Iwa, or one's destiny. Iwa is not chosen by the gods or assigned randomly by the Morai, as in Greek cosmology, Rather, before birth, when one is in the world of the yet-to-be-born, the individual spirit performs what is called a kunleye, to kneel and choose, in which the spirit kneels before the creator, God, and chooses its iwa. Iwa is not inherently good or bad, negative or positive. It is simply the destiny that the spirit has chosen. The way in which that destiny is then pursued determines whether or not one is acting in accord with the gods in the world. The Iwa cannot be avoided, but the person chooses that, chooses that, that you are freely. Furthermore, as in Ijwa culture, sacrifice can influence events. Allow the gods or our ancestors to interfere and even change, not Iwa, but the manner in which destiny is achieved. In each of these cultures, and many more, too many to mention here, 
most of them, the fates are portrayed as old women, sometimes crippled or lame, who are stern and inflexible, immune to any entreaty from humankind. So why was this concept so pervasive and persuasive to our ancestors? Why does the concept still exist today, which with much of its original power intact? One answer lies in the concept of unpredictability. Very often we cannot control external events. War, natural disasters, and disease are all to one extent or another uncontrollable. In the aftermath of such an uncontrollable con- controllable event, we seem to find some comfort in believing that the event was either fate or destined to happen. The belief that the tragedy was preordained is psychologically preferable to believing that the universe is essentially chaotic and random. In other words, fate and predestination impose a pattern and order on events that are, in reality, disordered and unpredictable. There is another reason why the idea of fate holds that the idea that fate holds is so fascinating to us. When we are faced with a situation where we don't know what to do, believing in fate can help us deal with our indecision or indecisiveness. If an outcome is fated to occur, then our ability to choose a course of action becomes easier to deal with. In this situation, a belief in fate takes the sting out of the uncertainty or the ambiguity of the future. Whatever happens was bound to happen, no matter how we decided to act. We came from a chaotic environment in which we had little control. In order to make sense of tragedy, we developed the concept of fate as a coping mechanism. We still live in a chaotic environment. We are still faced with a plethora of uncontrollable events, any one of which could spell our personal extinction. The temptation to believe in fate is still strong. The universe, while oh so beautiful, seems to be essentially indifferent to our individual survival or the survival of those who we hold dear. Fate provides the fiction that the universe is not indifferent. We may not be in control of our own destinies. We may simply be poor players who strut and fret our hour upon the stage of life, but at least we have a part. We are not ignored by the cosmos. In reality, each of us actually is in control of our own life. We have the power to effectuate the changes that can result in greater personal happiness and success. All we have to do is take the reins and change direction. All we have to do is take the steps that will bring about positive results. All we have to do is work towards what we want. All we have to do is reject the false comfort of fate in favor of the real comfort of self-actualization and development. The next few episodes are not about fate, absolution, or resignation. They are about developing the self-discipline necessary to take control of your own life and kicking the idea of predestination to the curb. None of us are victims. None of us are pawns in a cosmic game that we have no control over. Each of us has the power to make our lives what we want them to be. With self-discipline, you can get what you want out of life. With self-discipline, you can achieve levels of success and happiness that you might have believed were not possible. With self-discipline, you do the work to become the best you and live your best life. In the next few episodes, I'm going to speak on self-discipline in some detail. To begin with, I will, be, I will examine the power of self-discipline. You'll learn what self-discipline is and why it's important. A step-by-step process that will let you develop your own self-discipline. And then some specific self-discipline tips that will make it easier for you to acquire the focus you need to get the things that you want. The universe may be chaotic, but your life doesn't have to be. You are capable of developing the mindset necessary to choose a course of action and stay the course until completion. Self-discipline, not fate, 
is the key to taking control of your life. My name is Ronika Jacobs from Strive Leadership Consulting. If you would like to learn more about my company, you can visit my website at www.striveforleadership.com. If you're interested in personal one-on-one coaching, please send me an email at rjacobs at striveforleadership.com. Thank you for listening to my podcast. I hope to see you in the next episode. Continue to strive for more and live your best life now. Thank you.